<laughs> the uh, graduate uh, uh, graduate fiction seminar at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. I'm Pinkney Benedict, and I'm your teacher and your host. Uh, and the uh, our opening uh, craft uh, talk will be given today by the podcasters and writers uh, Sarah Jillick and Elizabeth Engelmeyer. Um, both of them, I don't have formal introductions for them, so I'm just going to go from memory here. Uh, and, you know, my memory is sometimes flawed and sometimes conflates uh, different things. I'm remembering a lot of sword play and uh, rage. Um, but uh, uh, both, both uh, Liz and Sarah were undergraduates. Uh, uh, at SIU in the in the creative writing program, the the English uh, department, and two of our very best, um, both excellent novelists, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the the world of novels and the world of publishing, or I imagine you will, and I have some some questions for you, and maybe students do as well. What it means to be, you know, two of the best novelists we've graduated. Right. And how does that translate in the world? Right. What do you do with that? And in some ways, it's like being, you know, two of the best, like, you know, buggy whip braiders or something like that. I mean, it's good. Right. It's great. It's great to have a skill. And you all are ninjas. And, you know, um, and, and both of you brilliant novelists, I think. And in another better era. Um, you, you'd both uh, be famous now, um, and maybe, maybe you are. Maybe you know. Maybe um, anyway. Not to, but, but you know, you're. I'm not going to dig my hole any deeper there, except to say, I, I, you know, you're, you're terrific novelist. You're, you, you know, I, I have enjoyed every thing of yours I've read, and that, as you know from your time here, is not universally true. Um, that that you know most of the work. You know, graduate student, our work I read is it's jejun, but not in an enjoyable way, which is how I would describe your work is jejun, but in an enjoyable way. You are immature in a way that partakes of an immaturity that I enjoy. Okay, so, um, but primarily today, I think we're going to be talking about podcasting because you both have wide and deep uh, podcasting experience. You're both now actively involved in the um, uh, the podcast Saints and Witches. Did you notice this time last week an uptick in subscriptions and listens? Because this group were, were firmly instructed to uh, uh, subscribe and listen to your podcast. Was there any movement in the numbers? Um, not really any more than usual. So maybe okay, they didn't well, do their homework. <laughs> That's because they didn't do it, and I told them they wouldn't do it, and they all just look at me po-faced, you know, and, and they're like, Ugh, you know, and, and literally, God damn it, why am I Cassandra? Everything I say is true, everything I say is going to happen, and everybody's like, not me. How many of you are now subscribed? No, no, not right now, right? But how many of you a week ago subscribed to Saints and Witches and listened to episodes? Oh, thanks. Oh, That's okay. so nice. I take it back. I take it back. Um, it's not the people I expected necessarily, but uh, it's the audience. It's not the audience you expected, but it's the audience you deserve. So, okay, and those of you who didn't sign up, to hell with you. I mean, <laughs> I, I really, I don't know what else to say. I, I you know, I, I'm, I, I, I noted who you are, and I'm never going to sign up for anything you ever do, ever. Not going to buy a copy of your book. I'm going to ignore your thesis defense. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing with your time? Are you really that busy that you didn't have time to click on a goddamn link? This is <sighs> nice. This is irritating. <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys are here for fun, and I'm I'm getting all upset. It takes me it's right back to grad school. It, it's very it? nostalgic. It just makes me grouchy that people won't support each other. Like, and yet somehow they expect to be supported. And well, the <laughs> the writing world is very transactional in that way. Absolutely. Like, people are nice to you, like on the surface, 
but if you're not like reading their work and reviewing books and all that kind of stuff like they don't really care about you yeah no i mean that's that's exactly correct and you know you can you can do it either you know cynically or you can do it you know in a you know in a like i really should support you know the people who are you know from my institution and they can give me a leg up and stuff like that but i'm telling you one of the reasons we don't succeed as an institution far more than we do it has nothing to do with the talent of the people we graduate through here or the education we give them it's that we don't have any any cohesiveness as a as a as a program we don't right everybody thinks they're a star and everybody thinks everybody else ought to subscribe to their stuff but they can't you can't take five damn minutes to subscribe and just set it running in the background and go off and do your own thing and when you come back set another episode running um you know i i do that for stuff i'm interested in you know I give money to stuff i'm interested in i you know so do don't don't imagine that this is a world that's going to yield itself up to you unless you are willing to participate in the economy of that world right you you just you have no right to expect anybody to to sign up for your stuff if you're not if you're not signing up for other people's stuff it's it is that simple and i very strongly encourage you to support the people who are currently in this program and graduates of this program right because you're you know at some point you're going to want some support from this program you know you're going to want somebody me or somebody else to write letters for you to you know swear for you for jobs so on and so forth and um you know we don't do it for free uh or i mean we do kind of but you, you anyway all right i'm gonna get off that too i'm just going down a lot of blind alleys today sarah and Liz, is it like the old days? Does it feel like the old days when I was just trying to introduce somebody, give a nice intro to a friendly guest of the program, and I would end up shouting at the clouds and telling yep. people to get off my lawn? Yeah, pretty much how it used to go. That's how, that's how it feels to me, too. Okay, so anyway, um, uh, uh, so the podcast Saints and Witches, which is in witches, <laughs> you know why you never go hungry? at the beach what why do you never go hungry at the beach i don't know because of all the sandwiches there come on (laughs) got it (laughs) okay yeah well um saints and sandwiches Mm -hmm. um and uh, uh 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 and that is you're you're well into the 50s uh in terms of episodes uh by now yes 48 right 48 okay i thought you were into the 50s like extra fun time inquisition stuff like that we did right yeah yeah i mean but so so you're well into this this is a well-established um uh podcast and uh so so we will at this point i will turn it over to you except to say that um uh well you want to talk about your you want to talk briefly about your books and put up a link or links. Mm, I probably should have had that prepared. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bill, always be closing. ABC. True. Um, my novel came out in October of 2020. It's called Saint Catastrophe. It's a crime, dark comedy kind of thing. <laughs> Um, published by SFK Press. You can find it on Amazon. Unfortunately, that's the place to buy it from. Um, I know Amazon sucks, but uh, you you'll get, get it in two days. SFK, right? I don't think so. Oh, really? I think it's all through, like, they have a link on their website, but I think it just goes to Amazon. Oh, okay. I thought they did direct sales as well. I don't know. Maybe they do. I could be wrong. I don't know what I'm talking about so, most well, of the time. And so, but and you and I have been discussing, um, uh, b- 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 what is it? Some, what is it? Eighty one something? Eighty one? Archive eighty one. And Archive Liz has 81. watched it too. Liz and I have just been talking about it. In fact, and the 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 but but you very neatly anticipated the mole, I think in uh, 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 in Saint Catastrophe with the the fungus with the the giant 
underground fungus that speaks um, and and lives. Yeah, there's a there's an episode from uh, from Saint Catastrophe, which is full of episodes. Any chapter of Saint Catastrophe would have been another MFA's whole book. Uh, 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 you know, just in terms of because MFA's tend to stretch stuff out across books. But these are two writers who get more in a chapter than most MFAs get in their whole uh, uh, get in their whole theses. So, it's, and that's that's one of the things is the is the great sort of psychic fungus, the the telepathic the telepathic fungus. It's Tell really me. like a god, I think. Yeah, it's like a it's like an ancient god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a it's a um, sentient mushroom colony in an in a mine shaft. The novel is set in southern Illinois, um, and as you may or may not know, there are many abandoned mine shafts in southern Illinois. So there's got to be something down there, right? Yeah, clearly there is. And and I mean, and this is really unexploited territory. I you know the southern Illinois novel because it's such a fascinating. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Shrooms. That is correct, Jody. It's it's. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's such an unexplored part of the world and so many weird things have taken place here. I mean, how many people here who are not from Southern Illinois know that there was a massacre, like 50, better than 50 people in, uh, Heron in the, what, 1920s, I guess. Um, and, uh, it, it, I mean, it was, and it was a bunch of, of scabs, right, um, who were, who were, just the whole town just executed them um and the town then then the town promptly tried to forget them right this was this was an area during prohibition and this brings us into the world of charlie Berger, perhaps um this was an area that during prohibition was a hotbed of criminality right of a sort of romantic sort yeah the the um you know the charlie Berger gang and so on and so forth well anyway I will, I will turn it over to you. Uh, well, and Liz, do you want to talk about your work a little bit? You've written many novels at this point in many different genres. Um, but it, so how do you want to represent your work for this group, your, your novel writing work? Well, I started focusing pretty much exclusively on writing suspense and mystery in my a fictional version of my home, home county in Southern Illinois. So just other books that are loosely connected to the thesis that I wrote, which I'm querying and it's going how it's going. So it's a very long process hearing back from agents. Um, just a glimpse into that for you guys, how long it can take weeks and weeks and weeks. You know, you get a, a partial manuscript request and then that's more additional weeks on top of that. So it has been um, the last like, half of my year is just doing that and that's and that's on and how many how many books are you are you do you have out right now or is it just the one uh your your thesis novel um am i shopping out or have i published yeah shopping i mean yeah yeah i'm just shopping the one and i'm about a third of the way through my next novel so okay good and these are big books you you write really big books mm-hmm how many how many words would you say is your average novel? Um, between about ninety five thousand, probably. Yeah, I was gonna say I thought probably a hundred k, but but big big books, yeah, big dense books. <laughs> no, they are they're I mean, they're really they're really solid, you know, um, uh, they they're really solid modernist fiction. I would say these books are thick. <laughs> These are thick ass books. H I C C, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. Liz's books have a fat ass, right? Mm -hmm. T H A T, yeah, that is correct. <laughs> Kevin Serrano Eshabri, uh, you you have spelled that correctly. Um, okay, so uh, now that I've yelled at everybody on our Twitch channel. <laughs> I just I don't understand it. I don't understand. It. Not going to get back into it. Okay, I don't. I can't uh, put the two of you together in any meaningful way that I and and 
So maybe what I'll do is put it on speaker, and as you interrupt each other, each of you will come up. Is that a good way for us to do the visuals on this? Sure. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to put it on speaker view, and I believe that that will translate. Sarah, not, are you in the center? Can you not okay. spotlight two people at the same time? I do, can I do that? If you spotlight somebody and you click on another person, you should be able to hit, like, add to spotlight. Oh, good. Okay. Well, great. I didn't know that. That's Let's cool. Do that. Yeah, well, these are From my SFK days, whenever spotlight I... Spotlight for everyone. And now add spotlight or replace spotlight. Whoa. 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 See, this Damn. feels like saints and witches. Yeah. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable now. This is what we do like every two weeks. So. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Well, so I, I, leave it, I leave it up to you. Take the next half hour and I will try to, I will try to stop my Biden-like outbursts of <laughs> <laughs> rage and incoherence. <laughs> Um, uh, where should we start? Um, so we, we've done a lot of podcasting, um, and lots of different kinds, all the kinds. And I have those files up and ready to go anytime you want to, you want to play anything. Okay, cool. Um, so there are really three ones that we've worked on together. Um, as Pinkney mentioned, Saints and Witches is our ongoing one. Um, if you didn't listen, <laughs> it's uh, kind of like, uh, well, it's nonfiction. Um, I tell Liz a story about a saint or something Catholic related. Um, and she tells me a story about a witch or something witchy or pagan related. Um, and, it, and it comes out of you. You are a, a practicing Roman Catholic. And Liz is a is a practicing witch, yes. Yes, and we're friends, <laughs> which does not always happen um, between uh, Christians and pagans, or just among Christians. Literally, we hate um, a lot. Yep, you between snappers, Catholics, and Protestants, as you so lovingly demonstrated just now. Yep. <laughs> 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 so we have saints and witches. Um, uh, we research separately and then we record via Zoom because I live in Galena and Liz lives in Carbondale. Um, and that comes out every two weeks. And um, But we've also worked on two other podcasts with uh, multiple other people um, throughout our audio editing podcasting career things. Um, so you mentioned Charlie Berger earlier. Um, I assume some of you are familiar with the book A Night of Another Sort, published by Southern Illinois University Press. Um, if you're not, I have a very exciting uh, podcast for you to listen to. <laughs> um, so we were working with SIU Press um, to produce their audiobooks. Um, in our 592 class a while ago. Was it 592? And we're, we're going to be doing that in this class as well. A slightly different sort of thing, but Amy uh, Etchison will be joining us in a week or two to, to get that gene. Nice. Um, I actually work for SAU Press remotely now, um, so I can see the other side of things, like um, not to gossip or anything, um, but it, it is so different the way that like meetings go like when when we were talking about the project the audiobook project in 592 um it was a much more like exciting and like positive discussion than the reverse was like when we at the press were talking about it in staff meetings so i think i just think it's interesting how like um people who aren't familiar with podcasting have no idea like what goes into it or like what it really is or like the equipment necessary or anything and the good news is you really don't need much equipment at all um which is what we find out we found out um i'm talking a lot if you want to jump in go ahead uh no um <laughs> no <laughs> a night of another sort was really interesting because it's probably the biggest project we ever took on and it happened right as the pandemic hit so mm -hmm. 
not only was it our project with the most moving parts, but we were trying to do it 100% remotely where we'd never learned remotely. We'd never done group work remotely. Um, we'd never done podcasting from our own houses. We'd had, you know, the studio at the school. So um, it was a really big learning experience. And then we were like, let's make this even more difficult. And let's produce four episodes, five episodes a week um, because we yep. needed ourselves. <laughs> And we really wanted to be, well, it was a competition, which I think brings out the best in both of us. Like, it doesn't necessarily bring out the best work in everybody, but I think we thrive with, like, competition. And we really wanted to be the first podcast that Blanket Fort aired. Like, it's still by far the most popular of the Blanket Fort Radio Theater podcasts, and it was... It, it, that, that really got, gathered a big audience. Um, well, the other ones are kind of downers. <laughs> True, yeah, yeah. I murdered my whole family. <laughs> Here's how I did it. <laughs> destroyed my you know, city and occupied it for years. You're right. Yeah. Those are, those are definitely downers. I mean, they're great quality. I and agree. I another sort is there was just so much modulation and emotion that we got to work right. with. People well, and that was one of the like lessons that I loved that you all took away from it was how uh, the nonfiction was beating almost all of the fiction in the class, right? That the, the, in something that was real, the characters were stranger and weirder and funnier and wittier and more dangerous than the, the characters were in the fiction you were reading by the people around you. Right. And that was yeah. a, I remember that being a real eye opener for some folks that the world wasn't, isn't a boring place made up of kind of, you know, depressed graduate students, <laughs> you know, who sort of long for sex but can't have any or something. <laughs> right. That, that, it, that it's, that, you know, that it's actually, you know, it's made up of interesting, exciting people, or at least that's who the stories get told about. And that it actually doesn't make any sense to tell stories about sort of dull people. Right. right. End up with a dull story. Right. And so you have characters like Charlie Berger, who is like a literal cowboy who lost like most of the fingers on his hand and just like he's just like larger than life. Um, and then you have like side characters, like a million side characters that we got so many different people to voice. And looking back, like it was so much work. Uh, and it was so exhausting um but it was really fun too mm -hmm. it was the hardest i've ever seen graduate students work we worked very hard oh you you all really did i think you kind of got tricked into it um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah that was it was it was a hell of a job do you want me to play the little the excerpt yeah we were thinking maybe let's play saints and witches first okay and then we'll do a night of another sort and then um, locker 13. Okay. Do you want me to uh, fire up Saints and Witches? Yeah, and then we can do a night of another sort after that, if yeah. you wouldn't mind. Nope, happy to do it. What major ways to tell stories? All right. I'm going to share this out in the clumsy way that, uh, uh, that Zoom shares things out. And this is from episode 16. The title is A Baby is Not a Juice Box. Um, the theme of this episode. Your titles, your titles are one of the brilliant, <laughs> uh, one of the brilliant uh, uh, aspects of Saints and Witches, I think. <laughs> um, the theme of this episode was uh, essentially like childbirth in the Middle Ages. So that's what, the, those are kind of the theme of the stories that we were telling. So you'll hear part of Liz's story first and then you'll hear our like break sound effect that we always use and then you'll hear a little bit of the story that I told. Okay, one second. Well, I hate screen sharing on Zoom. It is the worst. I hate it. We should we should really just go to Discord. Okay, here we go. Share sound, and off we go. The second major way she kills babies. Thumbs up. And I shit you not, I'm going to quote this. 
she killed the child by pressing on its brain during the delivery. Ugh. Brutal. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I bet that did happen, though. Like, not saying that she was the one who did it, but I bet, like, like there was, like, actually a head injury at birth. Like, whether it was, like, I don't know. I don't know what, I'm, what the fuck am I talking about. But, like, that does happen. That's so scary. Ugh. Yeah. And I will, I will talk about some of that because, yeah, a lot of these things, um, I can, I can see where she's kind of made room in the story for like what actually happened. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the brain pressing happens quite a few times. In one case, she strangles a newborn. In another, she drops a child in the water below a mill. Um, late in the list, she starts burying dead newborns under doorways in the family's house. Um, she tells them it's to ward off miscarriages. She tells her torturers that it was really to like ruin the relationship between the spouses. It was to like sow discord in, in the household. Damn. Um, well, Perga gets a reputation for vampirism from one account where she sucked the blood out of one baby in a set of twins until the baby died. And then she spat the blood out and gave it to the devil to make more poisonous salve. Yikes. So she doesn't drink it, but I mean, she does suck the blood out of the in- an entire infant um, and <laughs> spits it out. And I'm just trying to, like... Do they not know how much blood is in a baby? <laughs> right. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, how could you hold all that blood in your mouth? And then I was like, how much blood does a baby really have? I mean, it's not like a juice box. <laughs> Why am I thinking about this? A baby? All- Listen, ladies, a baby is not a juice box. <laughs> it's a whole last <laughs> child. <laughs> that you, Liz, are a medieval Catholic woman and you're having trouble conceiving a child because that's something that you want to do as a <laughs> medieval Catholic woman. Yep. So, <laughs> so what do you do? What are your options? Well, you might ask... Kill my husband. <laughs> Blame it on that. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> I see no other option. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god kill my husband kill myself kill the baby Woof. um so you might ask your husband <laughs> hopefully you don't just murder him you might ask him to go out in the garden at a specific time and recite the lord's prayer or the our father while uprooting two plants you're gonna want some daisy and you're gonna want some comfrey Then you'll want to extract the juices of those two plants, and you're going to use those juices to inscribe a specific Bible verse from Genesis onto a piece of paper or a wax tablet. And so that Bible verse is Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 28, and the Lord said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And then um, once you have that written down, you're going to make it into an amulet that you can wear around your neck. Um, And you're going to wear that during sex. If you want a girl, then you should wear it. And if you want a boy, your husband should wear it. So that's just one option. Maybe try that before murder. Um, So what if that doesn't work? Um, Well, according to these medieval medical texts, it might have something to do with your uterus, because we all know it's always the woman's fault. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> so that not possibly have anything to do with anyone's sperm count or anything <laughs> at all no so that pesky uterus just might be a wandering around in your body it, it travels <laughs> around that hysteria you know sometimes it's in your shoulder sometimes yeah. it's in your foot <laughs> <Bring it in. laughs> so it could be it could be like between your lungs like it could be anywhere so we need to find it um a tracking spell for your <laughs> uterus <laughs> that's basically what this is so obviously the uterus everybody knows this the uterus is attracted to something that smells sweet it's a fact <laughs> and it's repelled by something that smells gross so Obviously, what we need to do is we Men, need to take a shower. <laughs> 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 
So what we need to do is we need to take something sweet smelling like honey or flowers and we need to put that between our legs, like right by your coochie. And then you want to sniff something like sour milk, like something gross. And then that will like yoink your uterus back down <laughs> where it belongs. It scares it back into place. Mm -hmm. it just... <laughs> and then you'll be fine. So that's Saints and Witches. That's like what we do. <laughs> it's um, very laid back. Um, it's a comedy podcast, even though we do talk about like stuff that's definitely not funny sometimes. Like we'll laugh at the weird stuff, but then sometimes we're like, mm, maybe we shouldn't be laughing about that. Our most recent episode, we were like, oh, it took a hard left turn into like downer territory. That's where it gets its title. Yeah, the title. It's a downer because it is just a warning before you go into it. Um, yeah, so what we do with Saints and Witches is we just use the Zoom record function, and then um, we take turns editing. So um, I take the odd episodes, and Liz takes the even episodes. Um, we try to make it as equal as possible, which is something I would definitely recommend if you're wanting to start a podcast with a friend. Um, I don't know if we would still be friends if the work was not as equal as it is what mm -hmm. do you think uh I don't think so either yeah yeah also we, we probably wouldn't be making the podcast anymore if it wasn't equal it wouldn't have lasted two years yeah and so like working with your friends can be so fun but it's also like a project um that you want to like make a good product um so that's just something I would keep in mind um but as far as like work goes, it's relatively low intensity to produce. Would you agree? Or maybe I'm like talking out of turn. Most of the effort goes into the research itself and actually writing the story. Whenever it comes to editing it, we don't have any backing music that we have to worry about. Um, it's just both of us talking. So the levels are really easy to balance. Um, so the editing itself is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we edit in Audacity. Um, if you are not familiar with Audacity, it is a free audio editing platform. You can download it right now and you can start working in it tonight if you want. Um, it's a fairly simple learning curve as far as um, different platforms go. Um, it's kind of ugly to look at, but it gets the job done. Um, and we learned Audacity kind of on the fly um in 592 when we were first starting podcasting and we still use it so i would definitely recommend audacity yeah so if we want to do move on to a night of another sort unless there are any questions well, and, it, and if you all can come back um at eight o'clock we'll have q we have dedicated Q and A time. If you if if you if we're because we're probably gonna oh, use got it. the whole fifty minutes. I, I don't know if you can come back then, but sure. Yeah, we can we yeah, can just give that Q and A that. time over to you all. Okay, all sounds right. good. Mr. and Mrs. Pat Pulliam and their friend Wild Bill Holland were leaving Grover's Place, a roadhouse near Heron, when bullets tore through their roadster. Although seriously wounded, Pulliam drove the car to the Heron Hospital. The luck that accompanied him and his wife that night did not extend to Holland. Upon hearing the news of his death, Earl Shelton eulogized the victim, reputed to have been his brother Carl's bodyguard, as the main support of his widowed mother and sister, a dear little mild-mannered chap. Another who mourned the death of Wild Bill was his friend George Wright. Just off his stint on the night trick, Wright was home in bed when someone knocked. It was Art Mann, one of the night men. He said, George, get up. Bill Holland's been killed. He's in the car down there in front of the hospital, and Pat Pulliam and his wife have been shot. Bill was in that car, and he was sitting on the right side. Pat had been driving the car, and Mrs. Pulliam had been sitting in between them. He, Bill, was sitting there. His eyeballs were out on his cheeks. He'd been shot in the back of the head, I suppose with a shotgun, slugs. 
I walked around on that side and opened the door. Back in those days, cars had running boards, and a thumb fell out on the running board. It was off of him. Later, Pat said to me he was in the emergency room, and they had already put his wife to bed. George, go down there and go through Bill's pockets. He has $50, and his old mother will need that. I didn't go through his pockets to get the $50, but stayed there until the undertaker arrived with the ambulance. I told him about it, and he went through the pockets and found one little old dime. Somebody had rolled him after they shot him. While Holland's killing remains a mystery, officially at least, a possible solution was provided by a former burger gangster in a letter to this writer. The careful reader will notice that his accounts does not match George Wright's exactly. So be it. To quote, Wild Bill was killed by Burger. It happened during a raid by the Burger Gang on a roadhouse between Johnston City and Heron. Shelton's were known to be there at the time of the raid, and those that could got away, fled, except for Wild Bill and Pat Pulliam and his wife, also shot in the gun battle. I was not a witness, but quoting those who were, Charlie came up behind Wild Bill and said, Turn around, you son of a bitch, so you can see who's killing you. So that's from A Night of Another Sort. Obviously, you can tell um, a little more complicated in terms of the editing. So this was one where the the work was in the, the more work was in the editing process and not in the, the prep, I would say. Um, we had a bunch of different voice actors. Um, we were working, Liz and I were working in a team of five or six other people. Mm -hmm to make this so um, we would each take an episode a week um, and there were like 20 minute episodes. Um, and it was like combining music, sometimes a sound effect or two, um, the narration, all the different dialogue. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> a lot of the times so we would have to go back to Ballard and be like, you said this word wrong. <laughs> you pronounced this <laughs> wrong. Yeah, like the night before we had to present them. <laughs> it got a little stressful um but so that one aired on blanket fort radio theater um and on npr one um pretty proud of that um yeah what else was i going to say about a night of another sort am i missing something i guess not no, i mean i but i just love that everybody had has names like you know Wild Bill. Do you remember some of the some of the, the monikers people had? Is he the Jew? Is he the <laughs> Jew? <laughs> that one got me every time. Um, high That's pockets, still, McCoy. I still call Cass and Is he the Jew? High pockets. I remember high pockets. High, high pockets. pockets, McCoy. Um, the blonde bombshell. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> they were all no, great. Just great names. Like, why don't we have names like that mm -hmm. anymore? Yeah, I and the, I could be yeah. the bald bombshell. I think you are the bald bombshell. <laughs> I, I, I think so too. <laughs> um, so then the last one we wanted to show you was from a project called Locker 13, um, which will always have a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first project we ever made, um, the first audio project um, that I ever made. I know that. Um, it was the first podcasting I ever did. Knew nothing about podcasting. Pinkney's like, you're going to do this. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Sing and or we, swim, I guess. we went ahead and made the weirdest shit ever. Yes, we did. Um, so I'm really proud of that. I'm proud of us for kind of just like trying everything at once, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so this was. We got people to sing. <laughs> we got you to <laughs> sing. Non, yes, us non singers. <laughs> Many yeah. non singers. My one my one singing role. Um, so maybe this needs a tiny bit of introduction, otherwise it would be like, whoa, what is happening? Um, it's a narrative podcast um with uh it's pretty immersive in terms of sound, um, sound effects, music, all that stuff. It's about um a fake reality show um where uh it's called the next marquee um the contestants are trying to become the next marquee of this haunted island castle basically and um so and found by podcasters so the only thing you can do is listen to this stuff and figure out what's going on right the audio is the only thing that remains of the the right, show because there's a, there's a sort of outer story right a frame story 
in which two podcasters have come across this cache of recordings, mm-hmm. right, in a in Locker 13. Yeah. yeah. And so, and they're trying to piece together the history of what happened. And that is literally the plot of Archive 81. I That's mean, why I sent it, it to Sarah originally. I'm like, this is just Locker 13 on Netflix. It is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, the the coincidences and, and things like that. But anyway, so here we go. Mm-hmm. I found the spa, finally. A little cold, but that's okay. Have I gotten fatter since breakfast? Jesus. Are you kidding me? You just ate. Why are you so hungry? You know, it's all happening pretty quickly. Maybe we should get to know each other? Um, whoa, what's going on? Who are you people? Oh, my head. Um, Marquis? Lilith? Is that you? Hello? Can you hear me? They're gone. Fine, we'll go eat. Oh, whoops, sorry. It's okay. Um, that was just the the scene where Izzy fights the Valkyrie. Um, but so that one obviously like even more sound effects. And that was working with a group of people too, where like um, we had the studio at least. So at least we could record together and kind of like give each other notes as we were going instead of like having to listen to an MP3 and then like text each other and <laughs> say it was bad. <laughs> um, so yeah so those are kind of like the three those are the three podcasts we've done right um each with their like unique set of challenges um i would say the unique challenges of locker 13 were finding all of those effects yeah and a lot of the times trying to like write the dialogue in such a way to explain what the fuck was going on <laughs> mm-hmm. the way itself was a lot more complex yeah and I think part of that was because like everybody in our group we had like five or six people everybody wanted to be the main character <laughs> <laughs> I know I did um <laughs> as Madison with a Y um I was very proud of that character and I still am <laughs> um and you being Adabel, the werewolf. Mm-hmm. Good times, man. We wrote a musical. Uh <laughs> it was the best. Hour and 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean you wrote like 13 songs or something <laughs> in in what a couple of weeks, right? And we weren't even on any drugs. <laughs> like we didn't even do Coke before that, you know? Like before that. Now, of course. Of course we do now, but (laughs) back then, it would have been really helpful. (laughs) All right, so these folks are coming up on uh, their their, um, in-class writing time. We're going to break here in just a couple of minutes, and then we'll come back at uh, 20 after 6, and we'll have about half an hour where we'll listen to what they did uh, over the the uh, uh, over the the in class writing time. So, do you all want to make a, a brief assignment to them, and then then when we come back at six twenty, they can uh, present it to you and hear what you uh, what you make of it. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, we were thinking uh, we would keep it simple. Um, we just want to hear your ideas for a podcast. Um, we want to know what kind of form you would like it to take. Do you want it to be sort of interview style? Do you want to make an audio book? Do you want to make um, audio versions of your own work or somebody else's? 
um, public domain books. Uh, I worked on an audiobook of Dracula. That was really fun. Um, do you want to make something really weird like Locker 13, where you get to write the entire story yourself? Um, do you want to work in groups? Do you want to work with a partner? Do you want to do it all yourself? Um, they all have their benefits and they all have their drawbacks. Um, so I would say write down all of your ideas, every single one. Um, maybe narrow it down to a couple um, and come back with a pitch. Good. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the assignment then for the uh, in-class writing time is come up with a pitch for at least one podcast and a, and a detailed pitch, right? Like not something kind of vague. I want to do something where there are voices and, <laughs> you know, they are, they are stuck to, you know, they, the, uh, you know, they stick to the hard drive and then I spin them out. Like, like come in, come in with a, a really good detailed plan. Right. And believe me, 20 minutes is plenty of time to spin out two or three very detailed pitches for for podcasts like learn, learn to put together pitches on the fly. Right. Learn from the moment someone starts to say to you, well, I want to hear a pitch for by the time they get to the end of that paragraph, you have your pitch together um, because people are going to ask you to pitch things. That's how you're going to get work. That's how you're going to, you know, that's how pretty much everything's going to work. And we're going to do a lot of pitches um, in this class as we, as we go forward. So this is your chance to, uh, to start. Has everybody got a grasp on their, uh, on what you're doing? Good. I like your, uh, your makeup, Kathy. That's, I wish, I wish I had thought to come. Uh, oh, I like it too. To come made up. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's good. And I would just say, don't be intimidated. Like you hear the word pitch and I always used to like my stomach would start hurting because I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to be like doing public speaking. Um, don't worry about that. It's okay if it's not perfect. Um, our job is to uh, give you advice to make yeah, it better. They'll help you sharpen. As people who have pitched and pitched and pitched, they will help you sharpen your pitch. And as people who know the pitfalls and uh, uh, and the 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 things that are, are not hard to do, or at least not as hard as other things to do in podcasting, they will help you play to your strengths and avoid uh, typical typical pitfalls. If you all want to work together, um, if there are people in this group that you've spoken to about teaming up uh, to do a podcast, then you know pitch with those people. You can pitch together and separately. You don't right. You don't have to stick to just one pitch. If there are other people you're, you know, you're planning to work with, either tell us about them or bring them on with you when we come back in a few minutes, okay? Um, you, you can make up teams of people in this class, people outside this class, um, you know, whatever you want to do. And if it's good enough, I will even sing a song as part of your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that, was, that was quite a, a moment in teacher over-involvement. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a perfect amount of involvement. It was it was it was really fun. That was a that was an incredibly fun uh episode. All right, very good. So everybody back here at uh 20 after 6 and we'll take half an hour to uh so and Matt, that's it for the for the stream, but we'll be back at 7 p.m. Central uh streaming everybody's streaming story time for this class.